Thank you, Brother David. Church, will you turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5? When I heard Brother David practicing that song in here uh, earlier before service, I literally thought it was a country radio station that had (laughs) tapped into our sound system. Who sings that? Alan Jackson? Who is that? Who? Really? I thought it was a country song. Well, you just made it a country song. It was meant to be a country song. You need to send it to David Crowder and say, this is how you're really supposed to sing it. (laughs) Oh, man. I've been blessed already today. How about you? That means if even I bomb right now, you're already blessed. Amen? But God's Word is good. If you're in Mark chapter 5, say word. We'll begin in verse 1. This is God's Word. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and cutting himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus was asking him, What is your name? And the man said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea. About 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The very man who had the legion... And they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore Jesus to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany Jesus. But Jesus did not let him and said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you And how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. May God bless the reading of his word. Title for our message today is Only Jesus Can Fix You. Only Jesus can fix you. It's been several weeks since we were in Mark chapter 4. We preached through our membership covenant. But if you'll remember the end of Mark chapter 4, Jesus was with his disciples on a boat, and a large storm came up as Jesus was sleeping in the boat, and his disciples were terrified of the storm, and they came running to Jesus, says, Jesus, do you not have compassion on us? We're about to die. And Jesus says, Why are you afraid? And he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. With one word, he says, hush, be still. And instantly, the storm ceases, the wind ceases, the wave ceases, the ocean stops raging, and the disciples feared a great fear at the power of Christ. Now, when it says in Mark 5, verse 1, that they came into the other side of the sea, This is the same day that they were traveling through the storm. They had just came through the storm and they saw Jesus 
instantly quiet a storm with one word. And now, he gets to a storm of a different nature. Not a physical storm, but a spiritual storm. And just as violent was the physical storm that the uh, disciples were about to die, so violent is this spiritual storm that you can't conceive of a more violent encounter that Jesus would have with this legion of demons. A man who is living in the tombs. This is where they would bury people away from the city. Living in the tombs and the caves and, and people would try to restrain him and he would scream all day and night and not even the chains could hold him down. He would break the chains and he would break the shackles and he ripped his clothes apart. This barely clothed, wild, crazy man living in the caves is Jesus' next encounter after the storm. And he comes up to Jesus and, and instantly recognizes Jesus. You see, demonic powers know who the Son of God is. The Pharisees couldn't see him, but the demons could. And they instantly recognize, oh, what do you have, to, what business do you have with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Don't torture me. You see, they already have their number written in the sand. They know what's going to happen to them. Jesus, don't torture me. Don't send us out of the country. But they see the herd of pigs, 2,000 pigs. Now for a Jewish person, the pigs are already unclean. But for the demons, they're just looking for something to inhabit and, and they request, let us go into the pigs. And Jesus grants them their request. And so these Thousands of demons. Legion is a word we'll talk about. It It means thousands. These thousands of demons go into these thousands of pigs and they drown themselves in the sea. And that, my friends, is the first case of deviled ham. I've been waiting weeks to say that, by the way. And so, this demoniac is instantly healed, I mean instantly in his right mind, sitting upright, clothed, I mean a normal person now, and, and, and the, the herdsmen run to the villagers, why? Because they were responsible for the pigs, they're going to have to prove people, hey, hey, Jesus done, uh, made all our kamikaze pigs commit suicide, and so everyone comes and they realize they just lost 2,000 pigs, now I don't much uh, know how much bacon is right now, but, but back then, I mean that was important to somebody, and they're like, uh, and they're greatly afraid. They tell them to leave. Well, what if the rest of the, the pigs and the cows and the sheep commit suicide? I mean, Jesus looks like a danger. I mean, this, this demon-possessed man, he was out in the, the cave screaming at people. But man, mess with our pigs. It's a bad story. And, and there he is sitting in his right mind. And he begs Jesus, Jesus, let me go with you. And Jesus says, no. Go back to your people. And tell them what the Lord has done for you. <laughs> How he has had mercy on you. Amen. So we're going to see a few things from this text this morning. If you have your bulletins, please take notes with us. As we dwell on this fact that only Jesus can fix you. The first thing we see in this encounter with Jesus and the demoniac is that Jesus has jurisdiction over your affliction. Whatever that affliction may be, Jesus has jurisdiction over it. That, mean, that means his lordship doesn't end at your affliction. He doesn't get to your affliction and say, well, I can't do nothing about that. No, my friend, he's got jurisdiction over that affliction. In this situation, everything that could possibly go wrong in this man's life had went wrong. Have you ever been to the point where nothing and no one could provide relief from your affliction. Nothing seemed to provide comfort. Nothing could fix your problem. Have you ever been to that point? That's where this man was. There was no one and no thing that could fix him. This man had no one who could help him. No one was strong enough to subdue him. He had no clothing to cover his distress. He was naked and ashamed. You can't get more downtrodden than this man was. The doctors couldn't do anything for him. The priest or the rabbi couldn't do anything for him. His life was literally in shreds. No friends, 
no family. His only company was the demonic terrorists who inhabited his life and made his life a living hell. My friend, this story is not about a physical place. It's about a, a, a spiritual place. It's about a not torn clothes, but it's about a torn life. This man could find no one to help him. He was financially finished. He was socially desperate. He was physically downtrodden, spiritually restless, mentally unstable, economically unsuccessful, rationally unreliable. His life was a failure in all forms. Some people think that their life has gotten so bad that Jesus can't do anything with it. The other night, Mayor brought one of my little G.I. Joe figures that I'd had forever. And he ripped his leg off. I mean, I took care of this thing for 35 years. And in 35 seconds, Mayor rips his leg off. And I look at it and Mayor says, Daddy, you can fix anything. I'm like, son, I can't fix this. You, you broke him. You killed him, son. You killed my G.I. Joe. There was nothing I could do. And that's how people looked at this man. There's nothing we can do for him. This man's life is so messed up. We can't do anything. Just like the disciples' boat, which was tossed upon the turbulent sea, this man's life had been tossed by the violent storm of evil. Some people think they get to the point in life where there is no hope anymore. Maybe there is no hope physically. Maybe there is no hope financially. Maybe there is no hope socially. Maybe your friends have left you in the catacombs of calamity. Maybe your life has been in utter ruin by the spiritual storm that you have walked through. Whatever that storm might be. Maybe you've lost your possessions. And you have nothing to show for the person that you are. <laughs> but once Jesus steps out of the boat... Everything changes. See, there is a Savior who calms the turbulent seas and He can calm the turbulent self. Some folks have meandered through life and it's a miracle that you have even survived. I mean, how did this crazy, demon-possessed man live naked in the caves for all these years? It's a miracle that you've even survived through what you've went through and why have you survived? God has preserved you so that Christ will find you. And when Christ comes searching for you, when Christ steps out of the boat, He doesn't call in vain because once He starts calling you, then all of hell must listen and tremble at the sound of Jesus' voice. Amen. Now the demons are no longer afflicting the man. Now Jesus is afflicting the demons. You talk about this man had a bad day. The, the demons had a bad day when Jesus steps out of the boat. Son of God, don't torture me. See, Jesus has jurisdiction over whatever you're going through. There's no problem too big for God. There's no history too dark for His grace. There's no sinner too lost for the Savior. There's no one strong enough to subdue the man, but Christ is strong enough. See, my, you might think that you're at the end of your rope, but friend, you are not at the end of your hope. Because Jesus can fix you. Don't look around at the power of your crisis, but look at the power of your Christ. He is strong to save. Secondly, we see in this encounter that Jesus has dominion over demons. And man, that's good news. That's good news. Some people are so afraid of evil, so afraid of uh, spirits, etc., etc. Jesus ain't afraid. Jesus had a donkey. He'd have a bumper sticker that said, ain't scared. Ain't scared. See, when Jesus says, what is your name? The, the demons don't reply with a name. They reply with a number. They said, our name is Legion. And Legion is a unit of the Roman army consisting of 6,000 troops. They don't give a name. They give a number. We are thousands. What's your name? Thousands. We've got control of this man. Thousands. And if you look at your text, notice this. It says in verse 8, and I love the New American Standard, it says, He had been saying, come out of the man. That is a continuation verb. That means something Jesus was repetitively doing. He had been saying, come out. Jesus was saying, come out of this man. And they start arguing with Jesus. 
See, Jesus hasn't bucked up yet. He's nice, Jesus, right now. Come out of the man. And when the, when the wind and waves instantly obeyed, demons want to argue. Now, that's an interesting part of the story that just follows Jesus calming the whole sea, and he says, come out, and they're still arguing with him. I should tell us something about the supernatural realm. It's not something to play with. Not something to mess around with. And he said, come out of the man. And they said, we are legion. When Jesus, show up, when Jesus shows up on the scene, no longer is this man cutting himself, but now Jesus is cutting the shackles of spiritual bondage that has kept him bound for so long. When Jesus shows up, the man is no longer screaming in pain, but the demons are screaming in fear. Don't torture us. All of a sudden, this man's trauma is no longer the central point of this story. When Jesus steps on the scene, now Jesus is the point of the story. See, your life is not dictated by what kind of victim you are. I'm about to preach to somebody right here. In our society today, everyone wants to identify with themselves by, by the trauma they've went through. Hey, listen, they don't leave you in the hospital forever. You're supposed to get better and get out. So when Jesus shows up, it's not about what you've been through and how hard your life's been and everything you've had to go through. It's about, I've got someone that can fix this. And you don't have to meander through your life anymore blaming all the, the bad things that have happened to you for your condition. Once Christ comes up, He restores you to a right mind, to a right spirit, and a right life. Stop blaming your parents for the way you act. You're a grown person. Stop blaming your socioeconomic upbringing for the choices that you make. I, I got to preach here for a second. I saw everybody this week upset about Nikes. Can I tell you something? When I grew up, I wasn't rich enough to have Nikes. I had Spalding. Y'all didn't even know they made shoes. Spalding and Voet. Walmart special, $15. You know the good things? During my whole childhood, no one argued about my Voets. Amen. No one argued about my Spaldings. I can remember seventh grade, I got my first pair of Converse. I thought I was the stuff. But you know what? You can't sit there and worry about how bad you had it for so long and say, well, I can't get ahead in life. Friend, once Jesus comes, He is getting you ahead in life. You've already been passed from death to life. Stop making excuses and start looking at Christ. Maybe you've been in bondage to spiritual affliction. Maybe you've been in bondage to drugs. Jesus have dominion over that bondage. I've met people who were heroin addicts and who were freed by the Holy Spirit from heroin. I've met people who were crack addicts and were freed by the Holy Spirit from crack. Jesus has dominion over that affliction. Maybe you've been in bondage to pornography. Jesus have dominion over that bondage. Maybe you've been in bondage to alcohol and you're like, I can't break this. Jesus has dominion over that bondage. Maybe you've been in bondage to sexual sin or to fear or to vanity or to pride or to laziness. Jesus has dominion over that affliction. Some people think that they're the ones who have to free themselves. Some people think that they have to use their own power to break their own chains. And that's your problem. You can't break a chain because the reason you're in the chain is because of you. Some people think they have the power to clean themselves from their slavery to sin. My friend, you can't free yourself from the prison which is locked by your own nature. You can't open a door which is closed by the deadness of your heart. When you look at the situation, there's no one, not even the man himself, that could help himself. That is why Jesus is the Savior and not you. <laughs> you can't remedy your problems. That's why you look to Christ who accomplishes that. 
That's why you bring everything in submission to the name of Christ. When's the last time you said, Jesus, I'm tired of fighting this problem. I'm going to let you fight for me. When's the last time you said, Jesus, I've been in bondage so long to this problem, I realize I can't do it. But praise God, you can. When you start declaring that Jesus is the one who fixes you, and you stop using your own force to fight the problems that's already your own fault, and you let Jesus fix it for you, then you see who is Lord. Your delivery begins with the declaration of who Jesus is. Falling down at His feet saying, You are the Son of the Most High God. If you see Christ for who He is, then you'll know that He has the power and ability to bring judgment or grace. And grace comes because Christ has taken the judgment for your sin upon Himself. See, that thing that you're struggling with and wrestling with and messing around with and dabbling with, Jesus took the punishment for that. He's already dealt with it. He's removed it as far as the east is from the west. Problem is, you're still identifying it as part of your nature. I like what that song said, my yesterday is gone. Friends, he's already wiped away your yesterday. Start living in today. And who he's made you today. Stop fighting what has had a grip on you for so long. Stop fighting and let Jesus fight for you. Lastly, Jesus conquers your condition. And turns it into a commission. This man for years and years had lived in an isolated condition. And people kept away from him. But now once Jesus comes, he's in his right mind. mind, And people begin coming to see what the power of Christ has done. See, when you're transformed by the grace of Christ, your life becomes a megaphone for the gospel. Now, some of you might think, well, my life really hasn't been that bad. The problem is Jesus doesn't save half bad people. Jesus doesn't save pretty good people. Jesus saves wretched people. Maybe your life was not defined by the shackles of adultery or homosexuality, pornography. But maybe your life has been dictated by idolatry. And fear. Maybe you didn't look at lust on a computer, but you know the lust that is in your heart. Maybe you didn't stay away from people, but you catered to every whim of the culture to fit into the culture because you're so worried about what people think of you. Whatever it is, Jesus had to save you from that too. There's no little sins. All sin is rebellion towards God. It doesn't matter if you eat the one forbidden fruit or if you kill uh, uh, the, the, the martyrs like Apostle Paul did. You are in rebellion to God. Christ only saves broken people because those are the only kind who need Christ. These broken people. And maybe the reason some people don't have a testimony is because they don't think they've been delivered from, from much. But my friend, you, like the demoniac from the Gerasenes, were spiritually dead. You were dead, shackled to your own nature and bondage until Christ brought you life. You had no ability to fix yourself. You had no capacity to deliver yourself until Jesus sought you. And just like this man, once Jesus changes you, he now gives you a commission. Go tell others how much the Lord has done for you. This man who was for so long a mouthpiece of malicious spirits is now a megaphone for the gospel. Jesus takes the most broken person and makes him the most whole person. Isn't that beautiful? See, when Jesus finds you in your mess, he'll turn it into a message. When Jesus fixes you in your test, he'll turn it into a testimony. When Jesus rescues you from your trial, he'll turn that into a triumph. Whatever has defined your life completely changes once Jesus shows up. And now you're no longer defined by your victim past. You're defined by the grace of God and the mercy of God over you. You're a child of the Most High God. 
The amazing thing in the Gospels is that those who are the most messed up, those who are the most filthy, those who are the most broken are the ones who see the grace of Christ. They're the ones who experience the grace of Christ. But the ones who are self-righteous, religious, think they are clean, think they're good enough, completely miss Jesus. And some people miss the wondrous grace of Jesus because they think they're good enough to get through life without Him. You'll miss it. And you'll come to Jesus and you'll tell Him to leave your town because He's messing up your business. You'll miss it. See, today there are those who have tried everything in life to fix themselves. There are those who have tried people. There are those who have tried alcohol. There are those who have tried drugs, sex, relationships, and nothing has brought you peace. Today you must look to Christ. You must see that nothing has fixed you. And you must fully depend on the grace and mercy of Christ to bring rest to your heart. Look to Jesus today. Confess Jesus today. Confess your sin today so that a mighty Savior can make you clean. And then go tell others what the Lord has done for you. He's given you a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit. And live in the newness of life. Don't be like a dog that returns to its own vomit. Live in the newness of life. Friends, Jesus can fix you. No matter what you've done. No matter what you've gone through. Jesus can fix you. If you're ready today, trust Him. Confess Him. I'm going to be down here during the invitation. If you're ready to receive Christ, I want you to come and I want you to make that public. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray right now, just as you had sovereign power over this man from the garrisons, God, you have sovereign power over each.